In chemistry, understanding how atoms form bonds to make molecules is critically important. It seems like it should be so simple. We really only have two types of bonding we have to worry about, ionic and covalent. And although we as teachers frequently do everything we can to help students understand the details of each type of bonding, without great molecular visualization, it can be very difficult. In this particular video, we're going to look specifically at ionic compound formation and how the Odyssey Molecular Modeling Program can help you understand with your students in much more detail how ionic compounds form and remove misconceptions in ionic bonding that frequently occur. Now, the very first thing students need to know to be able to understand bonding in great detail is Coulomb's Law. And in chemistry, is usually the first time when students have encountered this law quantitatively. It's a very simple law that simply says that the force between two particles depends upon two things. The first thing it depends upon is the magnitude of positive or negative charge each atom has when making the bond, either positive or negative. And of course, we must have one positive and one negative in order to make an attractive force. And the second component says that the, it, that the force depends upon the square of the distance between the two particles. Students frequently understand this law in terms of simple plug and chug problems and can frequently work questions, if you so ask, that allow them to calculate the force between two particles given the amount of charge or the amount of distance. Unfortunately, utilizing this law in bigger scenarios involving multiple particles or seeing how the law works in terms of forming the ionic bond is much more difficult. Specifically, we typically see several misconceptions students have. The first of these include the idea between global and local attraction. Many students think that when you have many ions in a system, that they only attract one another in pairs. They don't understand that if there are 10 ions in a system, that, the, that one ion will be attracted or repelled by all the other nine ions at the same time. And it's very hard without visualization to understand that, as we'll see. A second common misconception students have is the distinction between positive and negative charge. Students believe that simply by looking at a particle and looking at its interactions, we can understand if the particles are positive, if they're negative, or they're a mixture. As we'll see, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to determine if a particle is positive or negative from simple visualization. You have to understand that it doesn't really matter, and we'll see that in just a minute. The third compact is, can particles shield one another? A lot of students, unfortunately, believe that a positive particle could shield the force two negative particles feel for one another. For example, if we had a particle of positive plus two and two particles of negative three, that somehow the existence of the plus two particle makes the force of a different magnitude than nine times. And as we'll see, that's not the case. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, students believe that ionic compounds are discrete particles. Unfortunately, this is typically a consequence of how we write the symbolic nature of a compound like NaCl. We write down NaCl solid or NaCl aqueous. As a consequence of that, students believe that an ionic compound is formed when one sodium ion and one chloride ion come together to make a discrete unit. As we'll see by utilizing visualization, that's not the case, and that ionic compounds are a complex yet re repetitive aggregate of positive and negative ions, and it's impossible to distinguish a unique ionic unit within the body of the entire compound. In order to visualize this, we are now going to go to the molecular modeling software for Odyssey Molecular Explorer. <clears throat> and here we are on the splash screen for high school chemistry. And you'll see the uh, experiments uh, given to us right here. We're going to move down to experiment 28, which is experiencing ionic attraction. And within this particular simulation, we will be able to answer all the misconceptions we've just discussed and get a much more in-depth discussion and understanding of ionic bonding. So let's see how Lab 28, exploring the attraction between ions, can help to remove the misconceptions that deal, come with Coulomb's Law and also help us understand ionic compound formation. So if we look at the particular um, simulation on the left, we have two different types of atoms. Here we call them dummy atoms. They don't represent specifically a given uh, metal or non-metal or eventually a cation or anion because we want to emphasize here that ionic compound formation is specifically the result of having different species of 
alternating charge, a positive negative charge. It doesn't matter, as we'll see, if one were sodium or potassium or chloride or fluoride from right there. The only thing that will matter is the fact that they have different charges. So therefore, th in this simulation, unlike most of our others, we've utilized dummy atoms here. We call them A and B. Atom A are the orange atoms, and atom B are the white ones. And if we start the simulation right now and just run it, we'll see that the atoms themselves look right, light right now like they're not interacting with one another whatsoever. We see a whole bunch of atoms just moving around from point A to point B. They're moving in constant velocity motion except for when they run into a wall or run into another atom. Those are the only times we see interaction. And this is a clear, from a physics perspective, a clear uh, representation of particles that don't interact with one another at all. They're experiencing no forces except when they bounce into each other or bounce into a wall. Effectively, we've made here like we can explore in many other simulations in ideal gas. Now what would happen in this particular case if we were to give some of these atoms a charge? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause the simulation and under that I'm going to go to the build menu and go to under the build charges and I'm going to give all the atoms a charge of plus one. Now notice we don't see a visualization of them being plus one and I'm going to run the simulation and notice right now that the motion is very, very, very different. Immediately after the atoms were given a charge, they flew out to as far away as they could within the cube. And now they're locked there because, of course, they can't escape the hard cube on either side. But we do see that some of the atoms themselves have some very, very interesting motions. Primarily, if we look at this white atom right here, or its orange counterpart nearby, we see them oscillating back and forth. And this is very important that they're oscillating back and forth, because what it allows us to discuss right away is that the effect of ionic attraction or repulsion is not local, it's global. Because the reason why this one atom right here is oscillating back and forth is that this guy here is feeling repulsion from all the other 19 atoms in the system. Since these two orange uh, ions now are as close, close to the white one as possible, if the white ion moves a little bit too close to the orange on top or the orange on bottom, it gets thrown back towards the center. This position right now effectively is a position of unstable equilibrium where it feels a net force of zero due to the ions nearby above and below it. However, if ionic attraction were local and not global, another potential motion for the white particle would have been to fly to the other side of the cube, being equidistant from the two orange atoms above and below. Because we don't see that happen, we know right away that this ion is feeling forces due to every other ion in the system. The only way this particular orientation shows up, and you can see the mutual motion here too, which I find very interesting across from one point to another. The only way this mutual system and mutual motion shows up is that if every ion is feeling the repulsion of every other ion at the same time. Now notice, I'm going to build the other system here. Let's compare side by side and look at another model system, a copy, and you'll see the one on the right, if we compare side by side right now, has no forces of attraction or repulsion. But what I'm going to do instead here is give this system a charge. And in this particular case, I'm going to give this system a negative charge. And notice when I give it a negative charge, every atom having a charge of minus one as opposed to plus one we see that the motion is effectively identical. The only change that's happened is that where each atom is initially in the cube, at which vertex the atom is, depended upon the original orientation of the system. But notice the motion is completely identical. And that is important because if we actually look at labels for the given charges, we see on the left, all the charges in the system on the left are plus one, whereas all the charges on the system on the right are minus one. But notice, except for knowing the pluses and minuses, the motion is exactly the same, which indicates to us that we can't tell if a system has all positive charge or all negative charge. The only thing this particular diagram shows me without actually having the charge label is that every atom in the system has the same charge, either positive or negative. It's very important for students to realize that the identity of plus or minus isn't really that important. It's a historical designation. 
All that matters here is that every particle has the same charge. We could call it chocolate, we could call it strawberry. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters here is that all the particles have the same charge, and there is no way to distinguish that from the motion themselves. One thing we can distinguish from the motion themselves, though, is the magnitude of the charge. So if I take the system on the left, the plus one, minus one system, and change the charges so that they're plus five and minus five, as suggested in the procedure. Oops, got the wrong system there. Let's take this system and do it so it's plus five and minus five. Notice how the motion changes. So now, because the force these particles are feeling on average at the same distance is 25 times higher, because of Coulomb's law, where the force is proportional to the amount of charge, that the motion, that the back and forth motion has a much higher period. Those particles are feeling a much greater repulsion from the atoms on the corners of the cube because of the fact the charges are greater. So as a consequence of that, when the atom slightly moves off of its um, pseudo-equilibrium position to one side or the other, it's feeling a much greater force of repulsion, so therefore it gets flung back faster towards the center. And so therefore, the period of this oscillation back and forth for the particle on the left is much higher than the ones at minus one on the right. So unlike knowing if the particles are positive or negative, we can tell by looking at a system if the charge is greater than or less than by observing the motion. The greater period of motion, the more violent thrown back and forth that we see for the same displacement allows us to know that the particles on the left have a greater magnitude of charge than the particles on the right. But again, the identity, I can't tell, and you can never tell. You can only tell if they're like or unlike charges in that particular regard. Now, let's finally take the system on the right-hand side and make the charges opposite. So what we're going to do is we'll pause the simulation now and change the charges on the system of the right. We'll make A in this case, instead of minus one, we'll make A plus one. And let's watch what happens when we make A plus one. Notice the motion now is very different. All the particles now are aggregating and they only aggregate right away because they feel the mutual attraction to one another. But notice how they aggregate and they come together quickly. They aggregate if we blow in and see this in such a way that we have nearest neighbors plus minus, plus minus, plus minus, plus minus. So they've aligned themselves in such a way that every positive charge has two negative charges in the nearest neighbor and the next positive charge in the system as far away as it could possibly be while maintaining the symmetrical structure that we see here. What we have done now by keeping the charges equal yet opposite is that we have formed effectively a new compound. We have formed a stable configuration of all the particles where they are able to maximize the attraction to the nearest opposite charge neighbor while minimizing the repulsion of the other like charges in this particular orientation. And notice it doesn't matter how we start. I can go back to the system and remove the charge make it back to zero, zero. And of course now, since none of the particles feel a net attraction or repulsion from one another, we're back to our ideal gas scenario. But if we turn the charges back on, and this time I'm gonna do, let's do minus one for A and plus one for B. So we've reversed the charges from before and then run, sure enough, because of the global attraction due to Coulomb's law, we see right away that we have formed another stable configuration of plus and minus charges. We have effectively formed a compound of ions that stick together simply because of the mutual attraction is governed by Coulomb's law. If we compare this scenario to an actual ionic compound, which is our third system, Let's see how the two look if we look at them side by side. So if we look at the two side by side, we can see right away that the sodium chloride structure looks just like the structure we've just built, where the only difference is that we have more charges 
And since we have more cations and more anions, this structure has formed a nice three-dimensional cube as opposed to our limited rectangular shape because we only have 10 particles. The structure of sodium chloride is functionally identical to what we have built on the left. <clears throat> but interestingly, notice we cannot tell which one is the sodium and which one is the chloride in the system. When the system comes together of the oppositely charged particles, there isn't a unique Na plus or Cl minus or A plus or B minus or A minus or B plus, depending on how they're charged. The system comes together as a whole. We cannot identify a unique ion pair as representing our ionic compound. This could be sodium chloride right here. This could be sodium chloride right here. This could be sodium chloride right here. Defining one as a unique ion pair is completely impossible because of how the ions form together under Coulomb's law. It's unfortunate we write NaCl in symbolically as NaCl solid, but it's critical that students understand that the formation is the result of all the ions coming together, and once we build ionic compound, having a unique designation or a unique discussion of which one is Na plus and which, or which one is Na and which one is Cl in the compound is not possible. So this one simulation allows us to completely explain and understand how ionic compounds form, and uniquely that we can't define one Na plus or one Cl minus as being a unique ionic unit.